And so when Nato asked me, I hesitated for a moment because I thought, oh, it's going to be terrible. But I said, but the donut, she knows English very well. She knows Georgian beautifully. She, she's a poet herself. I don't think we could find anybody else. And as it turned out, the donut and I, when I came to Russo Valley, we were like this. She couldn't have been a better helpmate. I don't know what happened in the first book, but whatever it was, we got it sorted out. She was encouraging. She was meticulous. So it took me two and a half years, and I, you know, every day there was always Rustavelli to do, and I can talk more about that if you're interested. Then I worked with the Donas, word for word translation. I uh, sounded out the Georgian when I could. I asked people to read it aloud to me, and then I came up with a rough draft. Then I sent that to the Dona. She corrected that. She not noted mistakes. She'd already given me a whole bunch of notes, as well as her interlinear. And then if I really was baffled or couldn't understand, I went to the previous translations and read them. Sent it back to the Dona. If she liked it, she sent it to Nato. If Nato liked it, she sent it to Nodar. <laughs> and then at one point, Nodar added like <coughs> five chapters or something. There's a discrepancy between what he thinks is Rustavelli and what the <coughs> Other people think we can imagine if you work for two and almost a half years and you're done and you're happy and then somebody says, oh, by the way, there are five more chapters I'd like you to do. It was hard to do. Um, but we did that and then Levan, we did the afterward, Giganishvili, I think you say, he, um, he also had some corrections to me. <coughs> so it was really a team effort. And the really exciting news that I just heard this past week is that the Times, I mistakenly called the London Times, but they don't call it the London Times, the Times is going to do a review of Roosevelt. And this is, I've been crossing my fingers and hoping this would happen since September, since the London Georgian Film Festival. <coughs> and I was at that festival, I met Donald Rayfield. We were on a panel together, and of all the people in the world, he was the one I was most fearful about his reaction, uh, because I think you all know him anyways, world-renowned scholar and translator. And uh, I was looking through the crowd trying to figure out who would be this very prestigious person, and while I was doing that, this man came up to me and shook my hand and said, you've accomplished a miracle, and that was Donald Rayfield. <laughs> Okay, well that was that was easy. That was really nice. So I hope to go to Tbilisi in September uh, and do a, another translation seminar. But that's basically the background of working on it. I um, starting out, I from the beginning I wanted to translate it into Shirey. Uh, I didn't even really know what Shirey was. I said to him, Did don't know what, what is his form? What is he using? And she said, oh, that's Shirey. And I said, what's that? She explained, and she talked about high Shirey and low Shirey. And I was like, whoa. So not only to have the rhyme, but to have the Shirey and to the best I, I could do it was a real dream of mine. And you may know this, that English has more words than Georgian, but Georgian has more rhymes than English. So. You know, it's it's difficult to translate into English rhyme when you have a, a, a narrower selection of words to choose from. Um, I can't say how much, two times in my life, one with The Night in the Panther Skin and the other with uh, Yezhi Orten with uh, his poems. I don't know if you know him. He's a fabulous poet. If you don't know him, look him up, O-R-T-E-N. He was a Czech Jew killed in the Holocaust when he was 22. And he's a world-class poet. So when I read some of Hortense's poems, again, in very bad Georgian, I mean, my Georgian at its best was survival Georgian. I could just, um, you know, when you're out on the streets in, in Tbilisi, and you're a foreigner, and you start speaking Georgian, and they start speaking English back to you. So you say in bad Georgian, you know, where is the dry cleaners? And they say in English, is it down the street? And then you say something in Georgian, and it was my great triumph in sort of, you know, survival Georgian that by the time I left Tbilisi the last time, the Georgian would give up and start speaking Georgian. 
<laughs> Always before I had to give up and start speaking English. But this time I was able to do that. But I worked very hard at reading the Georgian and sounding it out. And I really just fell in love with Rustavelli, with the sound of it and with the story of it. It's, well, you know, but I mean, most Americans don't know. They've never heard of it. This is an incredible story. And these strong, in a way, very modern women and the tale of really poor people, and then <coughs> not including pride on it. Asma, um, I think of the whole thing, for me, the prologue is um, maybe my least favorite part of the book, because it's kind of static. <coughs> but I do like the thing where he talks about how it's kind of intimidating to be in love with a woman, where if you kick her off, then not only did she have you killed, but your family killed, your whole village destroyed, your region, your country, whatever. Thousands of men can die, you know, you have a lover's back, so. But I thought I would just read you a little bit so you can hear. Um, and uh, maybe I will do the prologue because that's the one we... Yes, I know. But, but you don't know my version by heart, right? <laughs> so just read a little bit, not the whole thing. He who created heaven and earth out of his power and might inspired every earthly being with his Holy Spirit bright. Then reigning over the colorful earth became our human right. And in our rulers' faces we could see his image in plain sight. O oh Lord, the maker of every form, I beg you to save me now. Give me sufficient strength so I may set my foot on Satan's brow. May you the longings of a lover lasting till the grave allow. Dissolve the sins I am carrying thence that make my body bow. And um, so, uh, one other thing. Uh, people have asked me about my favorite parts. Um, and also the hardest part. The hardest thing to translate to me. the page. Yeah, okay, it's a page. Uh, I don't know where I can tell. It's Quatrain 1656, uh, page 344, was the, at the very end, this quatrain about, I'll read two quatrains, but it, he's sort of summing up the whole story and what these two kings, what Alphandil and Harry, and what their rule was like now that they've gone through all this and they've achieved success and they've got it. Those three sovereigns loved one another. In ruling, they were skilled. They visited one another. All their desires were fulfilled. Those who disputed their rule met their swords. Many of them were killed. They increased their might, and bigger kingdoms did these sovereigns build. And this is the one. Their kingly mercy was given to all. It fell like endless snow. The poor stopped begging, widows felt safe, and orphans were helped to grow. Evil doers were scared, their ewes had lambs, but no milk to bestow. In the realm of their kingdoms, the goat with the wolf could safely go. And I mean, I, when I think about our political situation in this country, and how far it is from this. I mean, I, I think, I don't know of a, of a more distinct and more beautiful description of what a, a good rule is. And the really hard part about this was this metaphor of the sheep. To get the sheep in this, you know, beautiful thing. And the, I love this idea that their ewes had lambs but no milk to bestow. So this is talking about evildoers. They were able to do evil, but the evil didn't perpetuate itself. It didn't go anywhere. So he's realistic. He's not saying that nobody did evil anymore. He's saying people did evil, but nothing came of that evil. And I love that image. I think of that. Evil. They were used, had lambs, but no milk to bestow. So that was great for me, but very hard. And then I love this little epilogue. Okay. So, you know, just like really forceful and tough, and the men are crying and weeping. So anyway, he breaks down, he weeps, as you know, and then she says, oh, well, okay, if you're a lover and everything, now I have sympathy. And then I love how she hides the knight, his horse, the armor, 
everything is hidden away somehow in this cave, so that Teriel's not aware of it. And then her speech to Teriel, like, what are you doing? You're con talking with the beasts all the time. It's so sad. And Teriel falls right into it. Oh, if only I had a knight that I could talk to. She said, oh, no, you'd probably kill him. No, I wouldn't kill him. I'd embrace him. Oh, OK, here he is. <laughs> ah. And then they're embracing each other, kissing. I mean, the drama of this. So my next live stream is to go to Tbilisi and live there for a year to make a movie of the Night in the Panthers. I think it would be, and maybe they could talk in rhyme. <laughs> but you know, this saga is just great. So let me stop for a moment, ask questions, observations, um, something. This sort of uh, not a flood, rather like Wister Valley's. <laughs> Well, uh, I have a question actually. Uh, you told me uh, that you uh, found something very interesting, uh, right uh, style, something, uh, the style of the road was uh, rising. And uh, I was listening to that because I never was told that you told me that before. Okay, well, that, that, that would be the shiary that, you know, that is rhyme. That would be shiary? Yeah, it's a Persian verse form yeah. that yeah. used to belly either adopted or right. was familiar with where you have 16 syllable lines. So every line and you have 16 uh -huh. syllables. And a parenthetic, I could note, this was a big headache for I me. Mean, I got all done translating it. And then I realized that in English, there's disagreement about how many syllables a lot of words have. So, and you know, here I have to have 16 syllables. And I find out that, you know, for example, um, King, what is it? Uh, there's some word that has two different meanings. Uh, and I'm sorry, I can't think of it right now. But anyway, so I had to go back and go to places uh, I chose, I think, rhyme zone, and put in every questionable word and choose, is it two syllables or three? Because what I had done was, you know, where it was convenient to have two, I had two. Where it was convenient to have three, I had three. And I realized I couldn't do that. So anyway, 16 syllable lines is right A, 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 A. And then you have to have a pause somewhere near the middle of the line. And then you break it up in a high shire, which is considered the more no noble form. You have four syllables and four syllables before the sejour, before the break, and then four and four. Mm -hmm. And the low shire is five and three. Anyway, you know, the donut had talked to me, and we wrote back and forth. This is not how I'm accustomed to thinking of poetry. It's syllabic lines, but one of the things that I loved here, it recalled to me my first experiences with Anglo-Saxon verse. And when I heard Rustavelli, I, I thought of these lines. He shall the handra, hertha the kendra, mod shall the mara, the water megan litla. That's one of the oldest English poems. Unfortunately, it's you know not too far off from Rustavelli's time, but we can't read anything of it. We can't understand it. But Higa is higher. Higa shall the herda had. Higa shall the herda herda heart the kenra the keener. So our heads will be higher. Our hearts will be keener. Mode shall the mara our mood, or uh, sort of bravery courage, shall be more mara. The order of Megan Litlap, the more we get slaughtered. And this is from this Battle of Bannockburg, supposedly written by the last guy who's fighting the English, completely lost that battle. But they wrote this famous poem about how the more you kill us, the braver we'll be, and you know, we'll go down with you know, no more. So it's that swing to it that Shirey has. I think that's what you meant, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Most of the rhymes, Crucible uh, uses a lot of feminine rhymes, and I was most of the time forced to use masculine rhymes because English is already narrow in rhymes, and then if you try to do feminine rhymes, it's just, you know, it's, it, you can't get very many. Sometimes, like I've been in. What do they mean by feminine? Yeah. So, two or three syllables, like together and whether the feminine rhyme and blank and thank is a masculine rhyme. So. Um, I think so, well, the answer is the consonant or the vowel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's how the feminine is vowel and the consonant is masculine. Um, so uh, I can read it here. So this is uh, 
as about the passage I was telling you about, and uh, these are all masculine rhymes. She yielded not to Octavio. He was too hateful in her sight. Like a partridge pinioned by an eagle, she fluttered left and right. She kept calling on Terrio for help in her desperate plight. Octendil knelt and with exposed throat entreated her not to fight. So that's his first thing when he actually exposes his own throat. Don't, I'm not going to hurt you. But then when she annoys him, then he immediately grabs a knife. Okay, now I'm going to hurt you. But anyway, this is all masculine, right? Sight, flight, and fight. Um, I don't know if I can find, I mean, it, as I said, it's very rare to have a feminine uh, rhyme. So like, you were masculine, right? These are all masculine, yeah. But if you have something like weather or together or, um, I think they're part of the prologue. Uh, so if it's one syllable? If it's one it's syllable, it's masculine. It's more it's than one syllable, it's feminine. More than expected. change the sound. Yeah. I don't think that I could, uh, I don't know what an English style would be. Um, I mean, English poetry is a grab bag, yes, yeah, English is a grab bag language. And uh, we, have the, we have the good fortune and also the craziness that, you know, we, we combine two word stocks. We combine Anglo-Saxon for the short words and we combine the, the Latin name. The, in, the Indo-European word stock. So, for example, um, you have uh, cordial and hearty. So cordial we get from Indo-European, and it's very elegant and cultured. I, mean, I wish you a cordial welcome. It's much more highbrow and much cooler than the English, the Anglo-Saxon hearty. So uh, I'd much rather have a hearty welcome than a cordial welcome. So, um, you know, some of that is here. And there are places where I feel, you know, just through accidents of language where, you know, once or twice in 1661 quatrains, I think I was actually able to, to do it a little bit better than this ago. But of course, that means, you know, 1652 quatrains, I was not able to do as good. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Are you based in Seattle? Yes, I am based in Seattle. I have traveled. I have had many, many. I've lived in New Orleans and Michigan and New York, and um, but for the last mm, 14 years or so, I've been in Seattle. Mm -hmm. I'm going in uh, 10 days to Cairo. I'm going to be lecturing and reading to the American University of Cairo. Um, uh, I hope. To just for, well, it was 10 days originally, but then there were problems, so now it's eight days, I think, mm -hmm. just a week. So your background is in um, poetry and languages? Yeah, poetry and languages. What I mean, um, I've had a kind of checkered career. I've been, uh, I was a pizza tosser at one point in, in New York. Uh, I've been a waitress. I was, I taught writing. I'm an actor now. I was a secretary and, you know, I've been, I've done, uh, Quite a few different uh, different things, but and it's not just poetry. I'd, I'd be very happy if you look me up on Wikipedia. One of the things is that I can't seem to settle. I mean, people go to they like something that I've done, like they like the translation, so I say you should just do translation, or they like my poetry. You should just do poetry, but then I have fiction. Well, yeah, I love your fiction. Just forget it. Then I do plays. Well, I like your plays. Forget about the fiction, the poetry. <laughs> But so, I, I, work, I work your pizza. Right. <laughs> no, nobody's ever said that. No. <laughs> I'm a terrible cook. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I can't seem to, you know, settle down to one genre. Can I ask a question? Yeah. First of all, thank you so much. Oh. You've done an incredible job. <coughs> to you. And, um, Basically, I want to ask you this question. The uh, issue of equality, which was a very tough century, okay. issue of equality between men and women, which was a very is saying, have you ever heard in any other literature of that period same ideas what was is proclaiming? Um, no, I mean, no. It is remarkable. Uh, but, uh, there are also things where, for example, Neston's uh, 
father can put her in a box and send her out to sea with, you know. Oh, that's, so that's there not going to give anything for some minutes. Yeah, I mean, it was very interesting to me how, uh, well, for example, I had a friend who wrote a review of this. And a couple of things he objected to, and, and I understand that. One is it's, it's a little alarming how the people slaughter animals. Like it opens with this hunt. You know, who can do better, the king or Octondale? And so they beat in all these gazelles and antelope and deer and rabbits and everything, and hundreds of animals are killed. And okay, so the king was not the best shot Octondale was. But it's kind of, you know, the blood is running on the ground and the animals are, I mean, it's... We're talking about 16th century. Well, that was common until 20th century. Right, exactly, <laughs> but, but that's what I mean. So. It's, uh, for me, anyway, reading it, it's like I read a portion and you think, wow, these women are, you know, they're so strong and they, it, in a way, it's not even equal. I mean, the women here held, <laughs> on the other hand, look at Asma, she's, you know, she's anybody's equal in smarts and everything like that, but yet she's, you know, definitely a servant and doing... Yeah, just the verses that Lake will only a story of the... I'm sorry, I can't understand what you're um, In English... Uh, Actually, you just wrote about the lion. Yes. Yeah. yeah, lion right. cops. Lion well, cops are the same. Absolutely. Well, I think the whole, yeah, the whole. I never heard that they said right. any other literature no. in the world, in no. any other culture of literature. No, and, and you don't find King Tamar either. <laughs> yeah. 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 No. I mean, it starts with that and it runs from that, that this is the premise and talking about how much she bowled our king, King Tamar. and. You know, when I first, I mean, that's amazing. So, uh, it, no, it's unique in my way. Because we didn't have even 21st century here equal, even pay for women and men. That's ridiculous. Well, and for me, again, I, and this might not be right, but it, it seems to me that other side of the fact that these knights are crying and are all, and not only for themselves, but if you're not, your friend is crying, you're not unhappy enough, you should scratch your cheeks or beat your head against the wall until you feel like crying. Um, you know, for me, King Arthur and his knights, I mean, I don't, I can't remember a single case where a knight would cry. I mean, the knight was, you know, had no feelings. Poker so face. Here you know, huh? Poker face. Yeah, poker face. So here you have, you know, with the women, this amazing, and I don't know how it happened. I think it's because Georgia was, uh, you know, its own thing. It was not uh, sort of corrupted by it by the view of uh, women. I don't know. Yeah, even in the Nibelungs, they're uh, <laughs> not, not crying. <laughs> I, I know. Nobody's crying. <laughs> uh, uh, crying, I think it's a, uh, well, uh, it's a it's a metaphor, teaching somebody, but uh, the crying is more not a physical cry, but it's sorrow. We're going to be in sorrow. Yeah, so no, because he talks about, you know, you have to cry oh, so many tears. Yeah, the gush of blood and the blood. Okay, we're about to cry, baby. So, uh, <laughs> just, just don't cry now. <laughs> 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 no, that's I'm not even emotional. But that crying babies uh, basically had the country, and some others who didn't cry doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, they yeah. right. survived. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I love the part, you know, one of my other favorite parts, well, for example, when I was translating this, I would tell my granddaughters about this, and they were at that time, they were like nine years old, the oldest one, and I'd come on and say, what happened to Terrell next? Uh -huh. <laughs> and it was like, great, all right. No, obviously, thank he's you so fun. much. It's, right, he's so it's, fun. it's incredible. Well, yeah, well, yeah let's go, I can say that uh, absolutely, anybody can read it. I can understand better than uh, in Georgian. I had no. It was hard. <laughs> in Georgia, it was we were forced to. Uh, well, I think that I just hated. I just hated to tell them that the very young age was forced to. I just wanted to burn. Develop the anti I was in second grade. Whenever I knew hundred years old, I was like, "Oh, I'm going to die." Yeah. 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 I, I've never met such a generous people as the Georgian people. And the story that I tell Americans about this is that I was trying to meet a, a woman, Nino Spanadze, who works at the American Embassy. And she, first of all, I went to the American Embassy because I'm an American, I'm in Tbilisi, and I naively thought that my embassy would welcome me because 
Right. And I'm waiting in line for, you know, two hours, and there are armed soldiers everywhere, and it looks like a prison, and everybody's nervous, and every cameras are everywhere, and I'm like, and they won't let me in. You have to make an appointment. Right. But not only appointment, you have to be cleared from the appointment. So what, you know, my vision of the embassy at that point is you break a leg or whatever. You go to the American embassy because this is your countryman, and they'll help you. Oh, no. So I'm trying to get in, and I can't make, when the Americans are the worst, they're just like, why are you here? Do you have what? You have some bureaucratic form that you want? No, I just want to see my embassy. Oh no, we, you know, no. And then Nina was coming out. She took pity on me and she said, "I will, you know, let, let me come and we'll go." And we became very good friends after that. But anyway, so I knew about her and she'd been so kind. So I was eating comfort food at the Hilton. I think it was. I had been had a long hard day, and so I went. I used to go to the Hilton and order the mushrooms. What's the with the cheese? What's that called? Anyway, it's this famous Georgian dish, at least for tourists. It's a famous <laughs> Georgian dish. It's the mushrooms with the cheese, and I would always go and have it. So I was there, and then I thought, oh, maybe Nino could join me. So I called her at the beginning. You know, can you come and join me? And she couldn't come and join me. She said, but I. As soon as I can get away, I'll come. So she came at the end of my meal. And I said, well, you at least have a cup of coffee. So she had a cup of coffee. And then the bill came, and she insisted on paying everything. And I was like, you weren't even here. <laughs> what? But of course, this thing about, you know, I'm a Georgian, I'm at home, and you're a foreigner, and so I'm going to pay. I mean, it was just incredible, the generosity. The other thing that really struck me was Georgian's high value of all kinds of art forms everywhere in the world. And I looked around and I, I saw one statue of a general on a horse, and that was it. And everybody else was a director, a ballet dancer, a writer. You know this, but for an American, all the statues have to be of generals or maybe a statesman or two, but you know, it's all men and they're all like powerful men. But here were all these artists and people being honored. And um, the donor and I we had our misunderstanding over <clears throat> a little prelude that I wanted to write to the Georgian anthology. Uh, the publisher said, you know, Dodona's written this very scholarly introduction, and would you maybe write something personal? So we were running up against the deadline, and I wrote this one page anecdote of what had happened to me. I was on a tour. The only time I took a tour in Georgia was a tour with a bunch of Americans, so we went way out and we went to the town that's famous for hammocks. I forget the name. Yeah. So you said everything's hammocks. So we, we stopped the bus. I said, oh, we're going to a town famous for hammocks. Let's stop the bus and buy some hammocks. So, okay. So they stop. <laughs> So anyway, it's not the most new. And we're all on the sidewalk and we're buying hammocks. And this woman comes up to me and she asks me in Georgian, you know, who I am and what I am. And I, at this point, I know enough Georgian to answer and I say, I'm an American poet and I'm here for the first time. Oh, she's so excited. She, <laughs> she pulls me down the sidewalk. She's babbling. I don't understand most of what that other thing she's saying. And she takes me into her shop. And it turned out to be a hardware store. And a hardware store was a small room, it was much smaller than this room, and it had little drawers from floor to ceiling with little tiny inscriptions everywhere, you know, and one drawer had screws and another drawer had bolts and everything. And so she goes behind she the table. She gave you three screws. She, she, no, she gave me better than that. She goes behind the table, the counter, and she opens up this big Victorian, like Dickens book, you know, like blowing like the dust. It's this huge book with all these lines, and she turns it around like this and she gives me a pen. And I actually thought that somehow I had agreed to buy a hammock or something from her. <laughs> and I didn't have any money. And I said, oh, no, I don't. And she said, no, 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 no. First time an American poet in my store. Please sign. Please sign. <laughs> and then she gave me a huge chocolate bar. Yeah. How she happened to have this huge chocolate bar. So I thought, you know, and I said, here in Georgia, where the people know not only their poetry, but 
you know, people were able to quote Emily Dickinson or Robert Frost to me, or they'd ask me who was my favorite American poet. I mean, to me, this is amazing. Americans don't know Emily Dickinson or Robert Frost as well as some of these Georgians did. So I wrote about this thing, and I said how in a country that, that Georgia so loved the poets and that, that I felt at home as a poet, and I was, you know, celebrated in a way I had not been in my own country. And she, that made her very angry. And she wrote back and she said, what do you think you are, the great white goddess, and you come to Georgia? And she took exception to the fact that this woman had this old book and this pen that she had to, and she said, you know, you're making fun of the Georgians or whatever. And so I don't know what happened there, but it was a terrible, it was the low point in all my <coughs> translation of Georgian poetry. So I wrote back and said, okay, I'm, you won't do it. Who was this person? The donor, because you're the one who then became such a great <coughs> <coughs> oh, <laughs> Yeah. She's at the university now? She, she, she retired. Oh, she retired already. But she, well, she spent... Um, but there again, <clears throat> I'm really grateful to Nato because Nato, uh, the donor said, you know, I'm already teaching at Indiana University and I can't, I can't take this on. This is going to be a major thing. It's going to, you know, I'm going to be there and uh, Nato uh, made an arrangement with the donor. She paid her, paid her quite well, uh, right up front, and paid her for the, to do this thing. And uh, I don't know what their arrangements were, but you know, again, she she did that. So um, who funded this project? What's that like? What organization? Yeah. So what is what? What organization funded this project? Oh, so Nato is uh, from a wealthy family. No relation to Giri Alishvili, who I translated as well. Um, she was a friend of Dato's, and she uh, Dato told her, you know, I met this American poet. She's wonderful, and she wants to translate with Savelli. And Nato, she works for the UN, and she spends most of her time, uh, recently, uh, has been in Azerbaijan, and only visitor there. Um, and she just uh, took it upon herself to uh, to do that. And I don't know if that lady would like to buy something or not. Oh, she'll be here. So. Okay. 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 Do you know who's going to be writing the Iranian poetry? Like a we were saying that in yeah, this book, yeah, yeah. men cry and they're in yes. their feelings, and uh, then we know that maybe this is a Persian story, and also mm -hmm. somebody used to like mm -hmm. the Persian poem. Well, you know, it's funny to me. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, you know, if it's not go back 700, 800 years ago, yeah. mm -hmm. when it comes to the love and loving, you know, and lovers, you know, lost or something, they, they will. But it's a mystical way yeah. of crying. Is not no, really no, no, it's a, yeah, it's a yeah, kind of yeah. soul cry. Like Rumi, the Kafir, Sadi, Abu Said, Abu Khair, we have many the that they were talk yeah, about the crying, remember. but not yeah. the real crying that you cry was crying from your soul, from your heart, from right. right, so from so far, but I'm not sure of the distinction because you know there are many times when it talks about the quantity of the actual tears. Yeah. 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 And so for me, I've, I've always been struck. I, I try to stay away from scholarship. <laughs> because, uh, I, well, I remember one time at my point of this thing, I, have, I had a friend in Tbilisi, Mama Kodalidze, and he is a philosopher. And he was excited that I was starting on this thing. And he said, would you like to come to my institute and maybe meet one or two philosophers? And we'd talk about, sure, that'd be great. And I didn't know why he seemed kind of nervous about this. And we get to the institute, and I'm, oh, yeah, and I'm expecting to have a coffee and hi, meet my friend. And he opens the door, and I go in. There's 40 philosophers in a semicircle with a moderator. The head of the institute is there with a microphone and a glass of water. And I realize this is a, an informal, official thing that all these philosophers. So they start grilling me. And they're really unhappy that I'm translating Rostabelli. And one says to me, I mean, because they're all philosophers, and in order to, like one says, in order to translate Rostabelli, you have to know all of Neoplatonic thought. 
do you know all of Neoplatonic thought? I said, no, but I bet you do. He said, yes, I do. I know all of Neoplatonic thought. And I said, and which philosopher would you say is the most important for me to know? And he said, Plotinus. I said, I'll bet you know Plotinus. He said, I know Plotinus very well. I've read all of Plotinus. And I said, in the Greek? And there was a pause, and then the other philosophers began to laugh. Because, of course, he read them in Georgian. So I said, well, it's lucky for you that there were Greeks who felt as great as Plotinus was, he should be allowed to be translated. I said, my translation can never hope to equal Rustavelli. It can never be that great. No translation can be. But I can tell you this, it will be much better than anything else that's out there now. That I can tell you. How many other translations are there? There's Venery Roshadze. There's uh, Marjorie Wardrobe. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, Stevenson. So at least three. But this is the. And then there's Vignera. That's, that's, that's the first one I mentioned. Yeah. 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 And she's, I think, the best of the yeah. early ones because she has that examiner feel. But when this came out, Levon, in his, in his note, he said, This is the best translation to appear in 40 years. Well, of course, it's the only. Part of the problem is because I think people love Rustavelli and they love the idea. I mean, everywhere it went, people were praising Marjorie Wardrobe. And I understand, you know, and she did a lot of good and promoted and blah, blah, blah. So these people don't know how awful the English is, how flat flipping they know. So, anyway. I have a question. Yeah. So, what is your favorite or you feel most important message that you have to humanity? Well, one is, you know, summed up in what a good kingdom is. I read that one quite I, I think it's like Shakespeare. There's not one message. There's, you know, there's many messages. One is about, uh, you know, the, 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 the tapestry of human existence and the adventures, you know, the killing and the lovemaking and the humor and the tragedy, and it's all there. Um, so, um, friendship. Friendship, friendship. I think, of all that's probably the number one. The love, I mean, to me, it's very striking. Optendil is wildly in love, and then he goes off. Well, what's her name? Optendil is in love with you. He goes off and he's a man in love, and then he meets Tario, and suddenly it's more important to be with Tario. I gotta say goodbye to Tina and I'll leave the kingdom and everything because that's where it really matters. And 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 uh, I think this is a big yeah. part of Georgian culture, actually. Right, the yeah, friendship, friendship is just as important as love, your partner, or anything. Right, and what's striking to me is that that friendship is male friendship. Even though the women are equal and everything, but the women don't have that friendship. Uh, I disagree. Okay. No, I mean, I don't mean I the know. Georgian women don't have that friendship, but I mean in Rustavelli, you don't. You see over and over again this male friendship. And what? And my one of my other favorite passages I've never talked about was the psychology of it, where, where uh, I love it. Abdel makes Terry a promise, stay right here, I'm going to go, and I'll come right back. So he goes, and he comes right back, even though he has to flee, and gets the king man, and he could be executed, but he comes right back, and Terry's not there. Which I love, it's so human, because in King Arthur, if you had King Arthur's great knight, and he promised to be there, he would be there. Terry, no, he forgot, he, I got bored. So he goes out, he kills a lion. So first of all, he sees a lion chasing he got a tiger. Bored he, will, uh... right. he sees a lion chasing a tiger. So he, he says to the lion, you shouldn't do that. This, you know, the lion is presumably male. You, you know, this is really sexist. This is a, a, so, and the lion doesn't like what, so he has to kill him. And then he goes to the, you know, panther and he says, I saved you and, you know, and I, you know, now you're, and he wants to cuddle up with the panther and the panther has, so then he has to kill the panther. So what happens though shows up, he's a wreck, you know, he's almost dead and he's very discouraged, I'll never mess up. So he says, just kill him. <laughs> they have this bond with these two friends, and the friend comes back thinking to help Tario. And Tario says, No, I've had it. You know, life is miserable. Just kill me, please. If you care for me as a friend, kill me. And I, I was so curious what would happen. Would he do it? That would be a bummer. Or would he not do it? 
But he says, okay, eventually he says, okay, I'll do it. But before I do it, I want you to do one thing for me. I want you to get back up on your horse. And he gets Teriel up on his horse. He says, okay, just, just ride a few minutes on your horse. And then what happens, of course, Teriel rediscovers that he is great. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. The original of Teriel, he kills Teriel. <laughs> Did you find it interesting that none of the characters are from Georgia in the book? Then none of them are from Georgia. Oh yes. Or the plot doesn't take India for the Arab. Atandil is Arab and Tariel is um, where's Tariel from? India. India. Yeah. I know nobody's from Georgia. Nobody's from Georgia yeah. there. Right. And the plot doesn't take place in Georgia. I'm sorry. Did you have any presentation in Georgia? Yes, we did at the Library of Parliament. We had a big formal presentation with a big poster. The, the president was supposed to come there. And I had a knitting needles and knitting supplies for him. So who is the publisher? Who is the publisher? <laughs> How long did it take? Two and a half years. Uh, that was everything. Almost everything. We have some of them. One of them.